<laughs> Good morning, Ocean Rangers, and thank you for joining us this morning for the Summer Kids Club. My name is Kaya, and I'm coming to you live from the Aquarium of the Pacific. And this morning, we are going to be talking all about an animal that you probably think of first when you think of aquariums. That's right, we are going to be talking all about fish. I hope you're as excited as I am. And if you are, I would love for you to participate. You are welcome to text in any questions or observations that you have while you're watching. I have Jen who is at the computer ready to take those questions and pass them on to me. Uh, that number is 562-286-1838. I also have Cynthia here in the studio who's gonna be making all of the magic happen behind me. And if you are watching this later, you are still welcome to uh, email us any of your questions at live at lbaop.org, and we will be sure to get back to you. Uh, just make sure that you check in with a parent first because uh, tax rates do apply. Now with our program with FISH, let us go ahead and get started. So first, we are going to be thinking all about what makes a fish a fish? What are those unique features that fish have that we know we're looking at a fish? Then we're gonna take a little bit of a deeper dive into their adaptations. And then my friends, the last part of our program is going to be thinking about all about tropical fish, just like the fish that you see behind me here in our tropical exhibit. So this is our live webcam that you are welcome to watch anytime you like. All right, friends, I think that's it. Let's go ahead and get started thinking about fish. Now this exercise, we're gonna put up some animals behind me and I want you to think about what animal is this? Is it a fish or is it not a fish? And how do we know? What features does it have that lets us know if it's a fish or not? Okay, Cynthia, go ahead, pull up an animal. What are we gonna start with? <gasps> is this a fish, my friends? What do you think? No, right? This is a turtle, okay? So when we look at this, <laughs> uh, how do we know this isn't a fish? What features does this animal have that is unique to being a turtle? Well, the first thing that I notice is this right here. What is that, my friends? That's a shell. Do fish have shells? I don't think so. So that's one way we know it's not a fish. And then what about right here? What's that? That's a flipper. Do fins or do fish have flippers? Nope, they have something else to help them move. So that's how we know that this isn't a fish. So I really want us to be thinking like scientists while we're making these observations. All right, so not a fish, and we know why because of those features. Let's go ahead and take a look at another animal and see if we can do the exact same thing. Oh my goodness. Well, these are very cute animals, my friends, but are these fish? Oh, Cora, you said it was a turtle. Nice job. Cora, any ideas what animals these are? So these are sea lions. And how do I know it's not a fish? Well, first of all, I can kind of see what's covering their bodies. It looks like they are covered in fur. Do fish have fur all over them? I don't think so. And then I also see something right up here. That's actually, that's like really drawing my attention. They have what looks like whiskers. Do fish have those? Mm-mm, they have something else. They have different, different things around their mouth. And then what about those? What are those? Those are ears, right? And fish don't have ears either, okay? So that's how I know we're definitely not looking at any fish here. All right, maybe we should actually take a look at a fish now and see if we can take a look at some of those features that do make fish fish. Oh, here we go, perfect. Now, how did I know that this is a fish? Let's take a look. Well, first of all, I do notice that it's got that eye and mouth. Okay, so that is a feature of fish. And something else that I'm noticing is what's covering its body. So when we were looking at the turtle, that had a shell on it, right? And when we were looking at the sea lions, they have fur all over their body. Well, what do fish have all over their body? They have scales. Thank you, Miss Cynthia, for helping me out there. Again, if you know the answers to these, please feel free to text in. We are ready for them. Okay, so you can see it very clearly on this fish here. So what are scales? 
Scales are a kind of hard protective covering all over fish's bodies. And scales can actually be really diverse. Some fish have very big scales and some fish have really teeny tiny scales that we can't see at all. Um, but it is, in all cases, a very protective layer. So scales are made out of very, very thin layers of bone, essentially. So why is that a helpful covering for them living underwater? Well, for one thing, it keeps them safe. It, re it really helps thermoregulate their bodies. It also is really good for swimming. Water passes over scales very, very quickly. And if we think about our own bodies, when we spend too much time in the water, like if you're taking a bath or if you love to swim like I do, what happens to our fingers? They get really pruney, right? They get really soft. So that doesn't happen to fish at all because they are covered in this in this protective layer of scales. And Cora says, fish have scales. And you are absolutely right. That is a defining feature of fish. Nice job, Cara, Cora. And you're also noticing that they have lots of colors. And that is a very unique feature of, especially a lot of the fish we're gonna be talking about, tropical fish, which have all of these really fun colors. Oh, here's another example, an angel fish. And again, we can see the scales very, very clearly here. And also actually just going to point out, since we were just looking at these two tropical fish, we see this little spot here in the back. Any ideas why fish might have that? So this is called a false eye spot, and this is a form of protection, kind of like scales in general, to help deter predators from eating them, to confuse predators, to make them think that maybe this is their face instead of right up here. Okay, so great. One feature of fish are the scales. And what else do we see on their bodies that let us know that they're fish? Well, I see these fins here. So this is what fish use to swim through the water, unlike the flippers that turtles use or sea lions use. And we can learn a lot about how a fish lives in the water by observing those fins, because the shape of fins can tell us a lot. Like, are they a fast swimmer? Or do they not swim very fast at all? Or maybe they don't have very big fins because they're able to hide and go through crevices and coral reefs and things like that. So next time you're watching a fish, take a look at its fins and see how it's using them to swim. But all fish do have these fins. And really quickly, this is uh, the fish, the fins on the side here are called pectoral fins. And then the fin here is called the tail fin, but the word we usually use is caudal fin. So caudal fin is just another term for tail fin. So those are their fins. Now, one other thing that we can take a look at on the outside of a fish's body um, are their gills. Now, what do fish use their gills for? Do you, any ideas? They use their gills to breathe. So my friends, we cannot breathe underwater, right? So we have our lungs. You can take in a deep breath with me. <sighs> nice work. Now fish do that using their gills, which is right here. Now it's kind of hidden, and this is exactly what fish want to do. They have a, a plate over their gills to keep it safe because if their gills were exposed, that would be something very vulnerable to uh, being eaten. So they don't want to do that. So they have a nice bony plate here that's covering their gills to keep them safe. But their gills function exactly like our lungs do and is what allows them to breathe underwater. <laughs> and Noah is saying that fish is so cool. I don't know if you're talking about our, our angelfish here. I think this is a queen's angelfish. I'm not exactly sure. But yes, tropical fish have lots of very cool patterns and they don't have ears. No, not exactly, not external ears like we do. So fish are able to hear, but we can't see their ears. So they don't have anything on the outside. Their ears are somewhere over here. And actually, I don't think all fish have any openings. I think it depends on the fish. I'm not exactly sure. Okay, so we've taken a look at a lot of the outside of their body. Really quickly, I wanna take a look, or think about at least, what's on the inside of fish's bodies. So fish are what we call vertebrates. Now, if that's a new word for you, all vertebrates means is that these animals have bones on the inside, or more specifically, they have a backbone. So if you want to take a moment and feel your backbone, we are considered vertebrates as well. So if you're touching your backbone, you might notice that there's lots of bumps, right? 
So all of those bumps are called vertebrae, and that's where the name vertebrates come from. So if you were tuning into our last program, Wiggly Squiggly with Miss Cynthia, you were learning all about invertebrates, so animals that don't have those bones. But fish are an example of vertebrates, and they're actually really special vertebrates. And we can actually show you a picture or an image of their bones if we want to take a look at that and switch over to our camera view. Perfect. Thank you. So this is a look at a fish's skeleton. And this is a bony fish. There are fish out there that have cartilage skeletons. Those are cartilaginous fish. But really today we are focusing all on bony fish. And so we can see they have that backbone there just like we do. And the reason I said this is a special group of vertebrates is because there are more of bony fish in the world than any other type of vertebrate. There are about 30,000 bony fish described out there. That is a lot of fish. That is more fish than any of the other vertebrate groups combined. So that means there's more fish than mammals and reptiles and birds and amphibians all put together. So that means that these are incredibly uh, adapted animals for their environment. And we're still learning more about them. There are about 250 species of fish that are being described every single year. So who knows, maybe there's actually 40,000 fish out there and we haven't discovered them yet. And maybe that's something that you can help with while one day, if you're interested in doing some discovery. All right, so now before we think about one other adaptation that fish have, I have a question here. Oh, Valerio and Hi Valeria and Hiro are wondering, how many types of ocean animals are there? There are so many types of ocean animals that I don't even know how to answer that question. There are invertebrates, like all of the animals that Cynthia was talking about, and actually 90% of all of the animals on Earth are invertebrates. And then there are vertebrates, like our fish. There are also marine mammals, which are mammals like us that are specially adapted to living in the ocean. There are reptiles, like our sea turtles, that also live in the ocean. And this is a great view of some of the diversity of animals that live in the ocean. Um, so this is our, again, our tropical reef habitat, which is representative of a coral habitat um, out in Palau. And coral is an animal too. So there are just so many types of animals out there. And I'm excited that you're excited to learn about them with us. Now, one of the very special adaptations that fish have that I wanted to mention that we don't talk about too often is something called the lateral line. Now, what does that mean? Hmm. Well, to think about this, I'm, we're actually gonna pull up one of our other webcams where we can take a look at some of our fish in our blue cavern exhibit, and we're gonna see a behavior that we call schooling. Have you heard of this before? Have you heard of uh, fish creating big schools before? So the lateral line is a feature on their body that allows them to do this. Okay, so here's our blue cavern exhibit, and I promise we have fish that school in here, although we can't see them right now, but just imagine it in your head. Uh, so a school of fish is just a whole bunch of fish that swim together. And a lot of times people look at them and go, how are they able to do that? How do they all move in the same direction, right? That's a pretty amazing thing to do. It's like, how do they know? It looks like magic, right? It is not magic, my friends. It is this feature called the lateral line. Now, all the lateral line is, is it's like a, a, a number of sensors that's going along the length of a fish's body. And pretty much all fish have this sense, these extra sensors along their body. So lateral just means along the side. Now, what the lateral line allows fish to do is sense changes in direction in the water. They can sense water movement, they can sense uh, water pressure, and it helps them sense distance even. So fish that school use that lateral line to uh, move together in unison. So if one fish starts to move in one direction, all of the fish in that school can sense that and move along. So great, here's a picture of a school of barracuda. I happen to think these barracuda are very cute. I don't know what you think, maybe an unpopular opinion. 
Um, and we can sort of see this lateral line right here. So you see it's just that line of sort of pores going all the way down a fish's body, right? And sharks also have this ability as well. And so, like I was saying, they use this sense to sense distance from one another and, again, sense movement. So if they start to turn, then all of the schooling fish are able to turn in that same direction. And why do fish form schools in general? Well, this is a form of protection, right? It's like protection in numbers. There's a whole bunch of them. It's less likely that one of them will be able, will be eaten. So that's one reason why they school. But all fish do have this, even if they don't all school together. Okay. Oh, Seymour is asking, what's my favorite fish? Thanks, Seymour. Maybe you can tell me your favorite fish too. So my favorite fish uh, when we're thinking about bony fish is the fish we're going to be talking about next, which is our parrotfish. So I'll talk all about our parrotfish in just a moment. But in general, if we're thinking about all fish, then I really love sharks. Sharks are my favorite animal in general. I think they're just awesome animals. I like them even more than whales. So that's my favorite fish. And what are scales made of? They are made of collagen. So it's kind of like a protein um, that helps it's a, and it forms a very hard covering. So if you feel your nails, which is, that's kind of will give you an idea of what scales feel like. All right, let us move on now to thinking about some of these amazing fish that live in tropical environments. So like I mentioned, Seymour, my favorite bony fish, at least lately, is our parrotfish. And we're gonna take a look at our parrotfish in its home environment. But first, here's a great little picture of our parrotfish here. And this is actually a really great picture because it shows one of parrotfish's very unique adaptations right here. So let's get started even just thinking about the name parrotfish. Why does it have that name? Is this a parrot? No, it's not a parrot. But if we look at its mouth here, we can understand where this name came from. So parrotfish have these really unique teeth that have fused together into a beak, very similar to like what parrots have. Now, why would they need this really hard beak? What do they use it for? Okay, I'm going to answer that question I have for you before answering. Uh, Valerio and Jairo are asking, what's my favorite shark? Oh, this is a tough one for me, but I'm going to go ahead and say actually the great white shark because I think they are pretty majestic. So here's a great picture of a great white shark. Gyro. Okay, excuse me. Um, so this is a shark that is one, a very large charismatic shark and one that we're really learning a lot about. So we're learning about their migration patterns, which I think is pretty amazing. Um, and this was the first shark I learned about that really got me excited about learning about all sharks out there. So I just love the great white shark. If you're interested in learning more about them, then I suggest uh, looking up OSEARCH, which is an amazing organization that does research on sharks. Okay, so I could spend the next 10 minutes talking about sharks, but we're here to talk about tropical fish, and I do also love our parrotfish here. So they have this beak, right? And why do they have that beak? Well, these animals eat algae. They tend to eat algae in the coral reefs. But while they're eating algae, they're scraping it off the coral. They sometimes also eat the coral itself. In fact, they do this so often that they are now very important for the coral reef ecosystem. They tend to eat coral that's actually already dead. And coral is pretty hard. So they not only have these special beaks that help them eat it, but they have another set of teeth in their throat that helps grind up that coral. Now, why is that important? Well, by clearing out some of these areas in coral reefs, that allows new coral um, room to be able to settle and grow. So that's really important in keeping a diverse and healthy coral reef. And let's go ahead and take a look at them, our, hmm, our parrotfish that we have here at the aquarium, and we can maybe watch it swimming around in its own exhibit. Now the coral that we have, that you see in here, this is modeled coral. Oh, look, there's our beautiful parrotfish. Oh, he's such a big parrotfish too. And this is called a bicolor parrotfish. So bi just means two. And if you make some observations, what colors do you notice on it? 
blue, right? And pink. So it's got those two colors. So that's why it's called the bicolor parrotfish. And we can kind of see its beak there as well as teeth. Okay, so I see a few more questions have come in. Uh, one question is, why are fish eggs round? That is just the shape of their eggs as they come out. They're just these nice little round spheres. So I can't think of another reason other than that's just the way they're formed. And Ella is wondering about why fish have so many colors. And there's a lot of reasons for the colorations of fish. So this is a really great question. So in tropical habitats, like the one we're looking at here and like our tropical exhibit we were looking at earlier, we tend to notice there are a lot of very colorful fish. So why is that? Now, one reason that is typically explained or given out is uh, for camouflage. And that is part of the reason. If we take a look at the habitat, so again, this coral is modeled, but it's representative of a real coral reef. And coral is very, very colorful. So part of it is to blend in to the colorful habitat. But another reason is uh, communication. So fish actually can communicate to each other just by looking at each other. So what are some of those things they might be trying to communicate? Well, one might be that the fish is toxic. So there is a tendency for poisonous or venomous fish to be really brightly colored and that serves as a warning to other fish, don't eat me. Um, and you see this in lots of animals, not just in the fish, in fish. Um, they, it can also serve as a warning that uh, I'm an aggressive fish. So for example, our clownfish, they have these very distinctive stripes. We might talk about our clownfish a little bit more later. And part of the reason why scientists think they have these stripes is because they're very distinctive. So other fish can see them. And they um, have a home anemone that they live in and they do not like other fish to come near their anemone. And that includes other clownfish. So having these stripes is a warning. It's sort of saying, I am here. Here, this is my home, do not come near me. Um, another example of this sort of uh, color for, you know, communicating its behavior would be the Garibaldi, which is not a tropical fish, but they're in the same family as clownfish. Here we go, here's our Garibaldi. Again, we see this bright orange color. But Garibaldi, they live in the kelp forest, and kelp forests are not very colorful places at all. Kelp is really brown and green and much duller. And so having a bright color like this, it might make you think, well, it's standing out. Other predators might be able to see it. But having this standout color is also communicating to other fish, do not come into my area. Don't come into my territory. And I have gone diving with this fish and I have experienced this firsthand. <laughs> they do not like you coming close to them. So that's another reason why fish might have different colors like that. And also just to find each other. So if we look at those clownfish again, um, I was reading about having those stripes is actually how they find one another. So having distinctive patterns is unique and they're able to find each other in anemones as well. Okay, lots of questions about colors. And I see a question here from Everett. How do fish get oxygen out of the water by their gills? Oh, this is a very complex question um, that I can't, I won't fully be able to go into, but it has to do with um, water going this way over their gills. And gills have the ability to sort of oxygen then diffuses into their gills. So as they cross over. So water goes through their mouth, passes over their gills, and they just have the ability, they have structures in their gills that allow them to get oxygen out of the water. There is oxygen in water and their gills are just adapted to being able to get it out. So really great question and thinking Everett. And I also see a question about why fish are so many different shapes and sizes. And shapes are another really amazing thing to think about with fish because shapes have a lot to do with how fish swim. So the ocean is a really big place and there's many different um, types of habitats in the ocean. So coral is an example of one, kelp forest is another example, the deep sea is another example. And in all of these habitats, um, having different shapes and sizes uh, means that all these fish have different niches within these habitats. They're really able to, you know, uh, exploit a certain type of resource. So having uh, certain shapes is what, you know, allows them to either swim fast or not swim fast or be able to hide. Um, so having all of these shapes and sizes is really what it has allowed fish to be so successful and why we can see so many of them. 
And Shinja is wondering, is there a leader in the school of fish? And that's a great question. And no, there's really not a leader. Um, so I think all fish are sort of equal within the school of fish. Um, I think any of them, if they're all swimming in a direction and then a predator is coming from any which way, wherever that predator is coming towards, the fish in that area are going to hopefully sense it and be able to maneuver out of the way and the rest of the fish will follow them. So good question, Shinja. Okay, um, so we have time to think about one more animal. We are looking at our beautiful parrotfish. Now we're going to talk about one other animal in the tropical environment. We're going to be thinking of our puffer fish, my friends. Are you familiar with the puffer fish? What do we know about puffer fish? What do they do? Oh, look at it. It's so cute. Well, if you're, let's see, I'll try standing on this side here. Okay, now if you're familiar with puffer fish, what do they do to keep themselves safe? They puff up, of course. So I was talking um, about fish shapes and sizes and how, what that has to do with, you know, their speed. If we look at the shape of a puffer fish, what, how would we describe this? So I think it's a pretty round fish. So in general, round fish are not very fast. But of course, being generally round um, is what allows them to puff up so big. Now, we were talking a lot about fish scales at the beginning of class, and puffer fish have actually lost their scale. So they are an exception to this. But in the case of our porcupine fish here, instead of having scales, they have these spines all over them. And that's another level of protection. So if they are scared, if something is trying to eat them, they will quickly ingest a lot of water. They can also ingest air depending on where they are and they will balloon up. They can get to be about three times their normal size, which is very hard to eat. And then they also have these spines, which also uh, make it hard to swallow. If you have this big spiky fish in front of you, that's not going to be too easy to uh, eat. And somebody said they blow up and that is exactly what they do. They're also known as blowfish for this reason. Now, puffer fish not only have uh, these spines and this ability to puff up, they have another defense as well. Puffer fish are very, very poisonous. So I was talking about colors and how that can serve as a warning. Puffer fish don't rely on colors to communicate that to other fish. I think they really rely on their ability to puff and their spines to say, do not eat me first. But that uh, being poisonous is another way that they can defend themselves. So pufferfish have lots of really amazing adaptations. Now, because this is such a great close-up look, we can also see its mouth here. Now, they have very similar mouths to our parrotfish. They also have had their teeth fuse over time into a very hard beak. Now, they do have a different diet, though, than parrotfish. So there's different reasons why these beaks have formed. So parrotfish use it to be able to process coral. And I forgot to mention that when they poop that out, that becomes the beautiful sand that we think of in tropical environments. So we can thank parrotfish for that tropical sand. They can poop out up to 200 pounds of sand a year. So thank you, parrotfish. Now, pufferfish, they don't use their beaks for this. They are omnivores which means they eat both um, animals and plants. But the animals that they like to eat tend to have very hard exoskeletons or live in shells. And so be able to crack through that and eat the soft animals, they need to have those beaks. And so that is what they use their beaks for instead of crushing sand. Okay, uh, we have one minute left. So I think we are going to wrap things up in talking about our Fish, but I hope you enjoyed learning all about this incredibly diverse group of animals and thinking about two um, especially awesome fish that live in the tropical environment. There is an activity that you can do if you're interested in learning more about fish. Um, there's a worksheet that uh, goes along with this that has a, let's see, a word search and you can connect the dots for a fish. And if you complete this, we would love to see it. You can text in your completed work to us. We'll put up that number once again, 562-286-1838. And Ocean Rangers, you can also tune in with us tomorrow at 11 a.m. We have more programming. I'm going to really quickly check to see what we're going to be learning all about tomorrow. Oh, my friends, 
we are going to be talking all about sharks. So today we were talking all about bony fish. And if you enjoyed that, you're gonna really love learning all about this very other specialized group of fish, sharks. So I hope you will tune in. We also have more programs later this afternoon that I hope you'll join us for. Thank you so much for tuning in today and I will see you next time.